everybody. Um, so I did a documentary film. It's uh, 93 Minutes of Oil. It's a two-minute excerpt that uh, explores the relationship between artists, especially uh, pop music fans, and how to change the relationship with their fans because of social networking and the internet and how artists have become more accessible and more realistic basically because of the <laughs> how uh, artists have become more realistic because of this and how it's uh, blurring the line between public and public and private life also. Um, so it's just 10 minutes of this. All right. And those of you who want to come in, come on in. We're going to shut the door here. So we always want and depends on the band and the um, demographic of their fans. Uh, a lot of artists are finding that Twitter is really effective in getting things out immediately into a large amount of people, but it may not be as intimate as, say, a blog, for instance. So uh, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. What do you talk about in the rest of the day? I mean, this is such a, you know, 10 minute, 80 more minutes of the Yes, um, there, it's actually divided into 12 different sections. Um, it talks about um, celebrity. Um, and it goes really deep into basically what are the implications of first off meeting your favorite band mm -hmm. and then secondly who determines that a 25 year old guy should be the role model for anybody <laughs> and <laughs> talks a lot about that and um, how it's changed in the 20th century because people are allowed to follow them on Twitter you know their everyday lives and then how mm -hmm. what those what becomes of that and how people are supposed to behave when you meet someone that you only follow on Twitter and how you're supposed to act and do you know them or your friends mm -hmm. and I find that it's what I can get into a lot more and then also the future of the music industry and how it's changing and how the way people are doing the combat, you know, the, the kind of album sales. Uh, how did you come upon choosing these particular bands? I, I wrote down a lot of the, the names. We the Kings, All Time Low, Sing It Loud. I haven't heard of these. How did you um, happen upon them and how did you narrow your selection and what genre are they? Um, I, uh, I run a magazine for five years about unsigned and independent bands on the East Coast. Um, so I got a lot of my contacts through that. So these are bands that are um, pop bands. They are very radio friendly, but they're not necessarily on the radio. They sound a lot like bands like Fall Out Boy and Paramore. They're signed to the same labels as them as well in some instances. And because I've known these bands, a lot of these bands I interview are like personal friends of mine, so it's easy to get the interviews and to get the right contacts in because of that. And I chose it because it's so similar to, um, it, it reminds me a lot of like, for instance, the Backstreet Boys and in, Sync. In they have a young fan base and how those fans become really obsessed and really dedicated to these bands, and you don't see it in every genre the way you see it in like these smaller pop bands. Thank you. What else? Yeah. Were you surprised at any topics that came out through your research, such as like adolescent girls' behavior? Or, was there anything that you didn't think of in advance as you're doing? Your research, you're like, I can take it in those stars. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, there were a few things that I really uh, I noticed that really basically stopped and caught my attention for a bit. Um, one, for instance, in terms of um, illegally downloading music, obviously the opportunity cost of a song has gone down to zero now because of the ability to replicate it easily. And what I found is a lot of artists have be kind of embraced and said, yeah, it's fine to download music as long as you keep coming on tours. However, touring has been down 10% in the last year, first of all, which is obviously it's not working out the way they're hoping it will work out. And then secondly, when you say, it's okay if you download my music, yeah, the artist wasn't getting money from the music anyway. The artists get pennies on album sales. But the engineers and the producers and you know, the people that own the studios and all those people aren't getting paid either. And if those people aren't getting paid, yes, the artists might be getting to their tours, but how are they going to record music if there's no one left to record music? It's one thing I really discovered, and I wish I could have gotten more into, but I didn't. <laughs> I was writing three minutes, so. Um, anyone else? I think I saw a hand over here, maybe. Can I ask one quick question? We, sure. And it has, you have to answer. <laughs> but I'm just wondering, uh, you know this fan thing with 
uh, kids at this age and so on. It's been going on forever. We all live through our version of it. What do you think is the most significant difference of this generation's uh, you know, involvement with this as opposed to, say, you know, other generations? I honestly think the only difference is the internet. Everything else is the same. I go into that a lot. Um, I have um, uh, Professor Campbell Duncan. Um, he's a teaches a critical decades from the 1960s and talks a lot about the Beatles and what it was like back then. And it's still, you know, young, dedicated fans that are really passionate about music. The only difference is now you can see what they're doing all the time on Twitter. We or had Tiger on Facebook. Beat it, so. <laughs> see? Like, you guys had a the quite an instant, right? And so that has, you can instantly know exactly what they're doing. It changes things a bit. But besides that, I think it's exactly the same. I don't think it's something new in terms of behavior. It's just they behave the same way they normally would, but now they can go talk to them. And that's mm -hmm. where it gets a, a gray area, and you can still try and figure out exactly what you do with that and how you understand that. One of the things I thought was really interesting, though, in regard to that was, uh, particularly when you were talking to the fellow who was talking about how he needs to be on Twitter because of the guest mm -hmm. There's a there seems to be a sort of a missing wall of the PR guy. I mean, Tiger Beat magazine had nothing to do with the actual people. Yeah. It was all about the PR folks. Mm -hmm. Here, the access can be direct. I'm sure there are yeah. intermediaries as well, but that almost seems like a new and dangerous and interesting. Yeah, well, um, there, like, uh, that reminds me, at one point on Twitter, there was a running trend. It was called, uh, it was like a hashtag, which is like a mm -hmm. trend on Twitter, and it said it was tour stories. Mm -hmm. And all these fans were giving these cute little, you know, 140 character, you know, stories, but they started getting to a point where you're like, you know, it's like one night I was really drunk and I right. did this, did that, and I was like, this has to be a PR nightmare for some label or some record label or someone. And they're doing instantly on Twitter, so there's no one stopping them from doing this. And so I find it interesting. Like I think I say, um, what happens when your role model is a 25 year old guy? You know, like you can't really. Uh, I don't know how the parents should be reacting to that or what they should do with that, but it's all. A big gray area right now. I think it's progressing. People are trying to figure out what they're going to do with all this that's going on. Yes, like the jobs for communications majors. Communications is um, one of the top ten majors right now, but only 50% of them in 2008 actually received a job right after school. And so it's kind of up in the air as to who's getting who. I'm still trying to figure out who exactly is getting paid in our generation. And, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to figure that out. Well, congratulations. So you're one of the ones getting the job.